a garden of pomegranates scrying on the tree of life Israel Regardie edited and annotated with the new material by Chick Cicero and Sandra Tabatha Cicero Introduction to the third edition The Kabbalah is rooted in the esoteric lore of Judaism that over time has come to contain elements of Jewish, Babylonian, Egyptian, Pythagorean, Platonic and Aristotelian teachings. It is the hidden wisdom of the medieval rabbis that was derived from older secret doctrines that dealt, dealt with ideas of cosmogony and divinity. The Kabbalah is the system of Hebrew mysticism that forms the foundation and the cornerstone of we all Western magical and esoteric studies. There are various Kabbalistic theories and interpretations and the Kabbalah has been put to several different uses theological, philosophical and magical. Its primary symbol is the tree of life which has been used by Kabbalists to study the nature of the universe, the essence of God and the attributes of the human mind and soul. The tree of life is a geometric arrangement of ten sephiroth or spheres which are each associated with a different archetypal idea or aspect of the divine. There are also 22 paths that connect these spheres. In the mystical Kabbalah, author Dian Fortune referred to the Kabbalah as the Yoga of the West. This points to the fact that the Kabbalah is an extensive system of spiritual wisdom study and self-growth. Like the student of yoga, students of Kabbalah utilize meditations and exercises to increase their understanding and experience with this mystical system. The goal of which is to bring the individual closer to God. The Kabbalah has been employed to interpret the Holy Scriptures, to create magical formula and talismans, to study the human psyche, to uplift the human spirit, and to find the way home to a restored Garden of Eden. One of the difficulties one faces when studying the Kabbalah is knowing where to begin. A mountain of information on the subject has been amassed over the centuries by generations of Kabbalists, scholars, mystics and magicians. It is easy to be overwhelmed by this enormous amount of material. Israel Regardie's influential work, A Garden of Pomegranates, was based upon his own Kabbalistic studies, together with information compiled from different authors on the subject, including Alistair Crowley, A. E. Waite, Eliphas Levi, Frater Achad, Paul Foster Case, and D. H. 
Lawrence. This text was designed to give readers a simple yet comprehensive guide book outlining the complex system of the Kabbalah and providing a key to its symbolism. The title of the book was taken from an important 16th century Kabbalistic text called Pardis Rimonim or A Garden of Pomegranates. Though Regardia's work has little in common with that particular text other than the name. Regardie wrote A Garden of Pomegranates in 1932 at the age of 24. Prior to this, Regardie studied under a Hebrew tutor in Washington, D.C. He developed an interest in Kabbalah, Hindu philosophy, yoga, and Rosicrucianism. At the age of 20, Regardie went to Paris to become Alistair Crowley's secretary. The young Regardie was admittedly in awe of Crowley, a famous, if not infamous, author of magical books. This is reflected in Regardie's early works, including A Garden of Pomegranates written only a couple of years after he left Crowley's employment. Wherein Regardie quotes and reads states much material from Crowley and Father Achad, who was Crowley's student. As Regardie states in his introduction to the second edition, he dedicated a garden of pomegranates to Crowley as a token of gratitude, but also as a symbol of spiritual independence from him. Because the Garden of Pomegranates was written prior to Regardie's initiation into the Stella Matutina, the most viable of the offshoot orders that developed after the disintegration of the original Golden Dawn, the book was not based on Regardie's later theoretical and practical understanding of the Kabbalistic teachings of the Golden Dawn. It was instead a compilation of material that Regardie had extracted from the sources named before. One indication of this is that the grade structure and the curriculum that Regardie outlines in Chapter 8 the latter is not that of the Golden Dawn, but rather Crowley's order, the Argentium Astrum, which was. <clears throat> I can show you something here if you are able to see it. Argentium Astrum, A, and then there's a small pyramid and another A and a small triangle of dots after that also like a pyramid shape or maybe a trinity <coughs> the Argentium Astrum which was based upon but certainly not identical to the grade structure and curriculum of the Golden Dawn. Within this work, the young Regardie, protective of his own Jewish heritage, 
occasionally directs harsh criticism at the Christian Kabbalists of the Renaissance period. In, this, in his introduction to the second edition, written in 1970, he admits that his vitriolic reaction at that time was a direct backlash against the patronizing Christian attitude of A.E. Waite. The works of the Christian Kabbalists, such as Rochlin, Mirandola, Knorr von Rosenroth, and Lully, are certainly important to the Hermetic Kabbalah that was espoused by the Golden Dawn. For a time, Regadi explored Christian mysticism with great zeal, and the results of his investigations into Christian science, New Thought, and the United School of Christianity were documented in his book, The Romans of Metaphysics, 1946. Regardie's classic text, A Garden of Pomegranates, is contained in part one of this new annotated edition. Readers of previous editions will have noticed a difference in the way Regardie spelled certain Hebrew words. Differences in Regardie's spelling of these words were due to a difference in dialect. Asgenazic Hebrew versus Sephardic Hebrew. The primary difference between the two, as Regadi points out in chapter 6, page 118, is that in the Asgenazic dialect, a form of Hebrew pronunciation used in Central Europe, the Hebrew letter Tau or Tav is sometimes pronounced as an S. Regadi's early works, including A Garden of Pomegranates, featured the Asgenazic dialect. Later, he adopted the more common Mediterranean Sephardic dialect that was used by Manic Kabbalistic authors, translators, and the majority of Golden Dawn magicians. Today, most Western magicians Hermetic students and Kabbalistic scholars use the Sephardic version. Because of this, we have changed the spelling of the words mentioned to reflect the modern usage that Regardi employed in most of his later works and that is much more familiar to contemporary readers. Other changes in this edition include new illustrations redrawn from the originals. We have applied standard rules of capitalization to Regardie's text and italicized certain words for emphasis. We have added all the endnotes. Part two of this edition contains our own contribution, scrying on the tree of life. In A Garden of Pomegranates, Regardie skillfully outlined a lucid introduction to the Kabbalah and described the basic concepts of the Tree of Life, the Sephiroth, the Navitoth, which are the connecting paths, and Gematria. But he did not furnish readers with practical methods for experiencing Kabbalistic energies and assimilating them into one's daily spiritual practice. It was our desire to make this new edition more useful to students of Kabbalah by adding effective exercises, rituals, meditations, and daily affirmations. In addition to this, we have supplied students with path workings or guided visualizations for experiencing the various energies of the Sephiroth and Navitoth on the Tree of Life. A path working is provided for each of the 32 paths of wisdom. The word scrying is derived from the old English word descry, meaning to see or to observe. 
It refers to a form of clairvoyance that usually employs mirrors, crystals, a bowl of water or other gazing devices to aid a person's concentration, train their psychic abilities and allow spiritual visions to come through into normal waking consciousness. The Golden Dawn's method of clairvoyance, called scrying in the spirit vision, is usually done by using a painted symbol, such as a tattva emblem or tarot card, to scry into. The path workings given in chapter 10, chapters 10, 11 and 12 represent what could be termed narrated scryings on the tree of life using tarot cards. Hebrew letters, images of deities, and other symbols relating to the spheres and the paths. They are presented here in the form of guided visualizations that can be used by students to facilitate their own unique Kabbalistic scrying visions. The technique for performing scrying in the spirit vision is described in chapter 9. Mystics have always used symbols to express spiritual truths that cannot be adequately explained by words. This was no less true of the founders of the Kabbalistic tradition who brilliantly combined the symbols, numbers and the glyph of the tree of life to impart their insights. They used symbols to convey spiritual experiences from one person to another. They also realized that Kabbalistic symbols could be employed by any individual who seeks to unlock the gates to loftier realms and to experience these realities for themselves. It is a privilege for us to present this new edition of Regardia's classic text, A Garden of Pomegranates, which explores these ideas. Regardia's work was one of our earliest introductions to the system of beauty, symmetry, divine power, and profound wisdom that is known as the Kabbalah. We, ha we have no doubt that today's students will find it every bit as valuable and inspirational as we did. Chick Cicero, Sandra Tabatha Cicero, Metatron House, Summer Solstice, 1998. Introduction to the second edition. It is ironic that a period of the most tremendous technological advancement known to recorded history should also be labeled the age of anxiety. Reams have been written about modern man's frenzied search for his soul and indeed his doubt that he even has one at a time when, like castles built on sand, so many of his cherished theories, long mistaken for verities, are crumbling about his bewildered brain. The age-old advice, know thyself, is more imperative than ever. End note here. Know thyself was the meaning of the great of the Greek maxim Gnothi Theauton, which was inscribed above the entrance to the ancient temple of Apollo at Delphi. The classical philosopher Socrates professed a deep concern with the idea of self knowledge expressed in this saying and the theory that one may be guided by an inner voice. The tempo of science has accelerated to such a degree that today's discoveries frequently make yesterday's equations obsolescent almost before they can be chalked, chalked up on a blackboard. 
small wonder then that every other hospital bed is occupied by a mental patient. Man was not constructed to spend his life at a crossroads, one of which leads he knows not where, and the other to threatened annihilation of his species. In view of this situation, it is doubly reassuring to know that even in the midst of chaotic concepts and conditions, there still remains a door through which man, individually, can enter into a vast storehouse of knowledge, knowledge as dependable and immutable as the measured tread of eternity. For this reason, I am especially pleased to be writing an introduction to a new edition of A Garden of Pomegranates. I feel that never, perhaps, was the need more urgent for just such a roadmap as the Kabbalistic system provides. It should be equally useful to any who choose to follow it, whether he be Jew, Christian, or Buddhist, deist, theosophist, agnostic, or atheist. The Kabbalah is a trustworthy guide, leading to a comprehension both of the universe and one's own self. Sages have long taught that man is a miniature of the universe, containing within himself the diverse elements of that macrocosm of which he is the microcosm. Within the Kabbalah is a glyph called the Tree of Life, which is at once a symbolic map of the universe in its major aspects and also of its smaller counterpart, man. I'll just show you here briefly. The tree of life, which we'll hear more about later. Manly P. Hall, in The Secret Teachings of All Ages, deplores the failure of modern science to, quote, sense the profundity of these philosophical deductions of the ancients, unquote. Were they to do so, he says, they, quote, would realize those who fabricated the structure of the Kabbalah possessed a knowledge of the celestial plan comparable to every, in every respect with that of the modern savant. Unquote. Fortunately, many scientists in the field of psychotherapy are beginning to sense this correlation. In Francis G. Wick's The Inner World of Choice, reference is made to the existence in every person of a galaxy of potentialities for growth marked by a succession of personological evolution and interaction with environments." Unquote. She points out that man is not only an individual particle but, quote, also a part of the human stream, governed by a self greater than his own individual self. Unquote. The Book of the Law states simply, every man and every woman is a star. This is a startling thought for those who considered a star a heavenly body, but a declaration subject to proof by anyone who will venture into the realm of his own unconscious. This realm he will learn, if he persists, 
is not hemmed in by the boundaries of his physical body, but is one with the boundless reaches of outer space. Those who, armed with the tools provided by the Kabbalah, have made the journey within and crossed beyond the barriers of illusion, have returned with an impressive quantity of knowledge, which conforms strictly to the definition of science in Winston's College Dictionary. Science, a body of knowledge, general truths or particular facts, obtained and shown to be correct by accurate observation and thinking. Knowledge condensed, arranged and systematized with reference to general truths and laws." Unquote. Over and over their findings have been confirmed, proving the Kabbalah contains within it not only the elements of this science, of the science itself, but the method with which to pursue it. When planning to visit a foreign country, the wise traveler will first familiarize himself with its language. In studying music, chemistry or calculus, a specific terminology is essential to the understanding of each subject. So a new set of symbols is necessary when undertaking a study of the universe, whether within or without. The Kabbalah provides such a set in unexcelled fashion. But the Kabbalah is more. It also lays the foundations on which rests another archaic science, magic. Not to be confused with the conjurer's slate of hand, magic has been defined by Alistair Crowley as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. Dion Fortune qualifies this nicely with an added clause, changes in consciousness. The Kabbalah reveals the nature of certain physical and psychological phenomena. Once these are apprehended, understood and correlated, the student can use the principles of magic to exercise control over life's conditions and circumstances not otherwise possible. In short, magic provides a practical application of the theories supplied by the Kabbalah. It serves yet another vital function. In addition to the advantages to be gained from its philosophical application, the ancients discovered a very practical use for the literal Kabbalah. Each letter of the Kabbalistic alphabet has a number, color, many symbols and a tarot card attributed to it. The Kabbalah not only aids in an understanding of the tarot, but teaches the student how to classify and organize all such ideas, numbers and symbols. Just as a knowledge of Latin will give insight into the meaning of an unfamiliar English word with a Latin root, so the knowledge of the Kabbalah with the various attributions to each character in its alphabet will enable the student to understand and correlate ideas and concepts which otherwise would have no apparent relation. A simple example is the concept of the Trinity in the Christian religion. The student is frequently amazed to learn through a study of the Kabbalah that Egyptian mythology followed a similar concept with its trinity of gods. Osiris the father, Isis the virgin mother, and Horus the son. The Kabbalah indicates similar correspondences in the pantheon of Roman and Greek deities, proving the father, mother or Holy Spirit, and son, 
principles of deity are primordial archetypes of man's psyche, rather than being, as is frequently and erroneously supposed, a development peculiar to the Christian era. At this juncture, let me call attention to one set of attributions by Ritangelius, usually found as an appendix attached to the Sefer Yetzira. There's an end note here on Sefer Yetzira. The Sefer Yetzira, or the Book of Formation, was one of the earliest Kabbalistic texts. It was circulated in varying oral forms from around 100 BCE to 200 CE, when it was standardized. This text describes the formation of the universe by comparing it with the creation of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. A brief tract from the Hebrew text written in 1642 by Johannes Stephanus Ritangelius called The 32 Paths of Wisdom was later added to the Sefer Yetzirah. It lists a series of intelligences for each one of the ten Sephiroth and the 22 paths of the tree of life. For each one of the ten sephiroth and the 22 paths of the tree of life. Oh, okay. It seems to me, after prolonged meditation, that the common attributions of these intelligences is altogether arbitrary and lacking in serious meaning. For example, Kether is called the admirable or the hidden intelligence. It is the primal glory, for no created being can attain to its essence. Unquote. This seems perfectly all right. The meaning at first sight seems to fit the significance of Kether as the first emanation from Ein Sof. But there are half a dozen other similar attributions that would have served equally well. For instance, it could have been called the occult intelligence, usually attributed to the seventh path, or Sephira. For surely Kether is secret in a way to be said of no other Sephira. And what about the absolute or perfect intelligence. That would have been even more explicit and appropriate. Being applicable to Kether far more than to any other of the paths. Similarly, there is one attributed to the 16th path and called the eternal or triumphant intelligence. So called because it is the pleasure of the glory beyond which is no glory like to it. And it is called also the paradise prepared for, for the righteous." Unquote. Any of these several would have done equally well. Much is true of so many of the other attributions in this particular area. That is the so-called intelligences of the Sefer Yet zero. I do not think that their use or current arbitrary usage stands up to serious examination or criticism. A good many attributions in other symbolic areas I feel are subject to the same criticism. The Egyptian gods have been used with a good deal of carelessness and without sufficient explanation of motives in assigning them as I did. It should be remembered 
that other mystical systems such as the Egyptian pantheon can be easily laid onto the Kabbalistic system, but uh, they do not constitute an exact fit since they are, after all, two different systems. Several Egyptian gods could be attributed to different spheres and paths of the tree of life. In a recent edition of Crowley's masterpiece Liber 777, which all found is less a reflection of Crowley's mind as a recent critic claimed than a tabulation of some of the material given piecemeal in the Golden Dawn knowledge lectures. He gives for the first time brief explanations of the motives for his attributions. I too should have been far more explicit in the explanations I used in the case of some of the gods whose names were used many times. Most inadequately where several paths were, were concerned. While it is true that the religious coloring of the Egyptian gods differed from time to time during Egypt's turbulent history, nonetheless a word or two about just that one single point could have served a useful purpose. Another end note here. The skin of the Egyptian gods was often colored a reddish brown, while that of goddesses was usually a golden yellow. The golden dawn's coloring of the gods has also changed over the years. Some of the passages in the book force me today to emphasize that so far as the Kabbalah is concerned, it could and should be employed without binding to it the partisan qualities of any one particular religious faith. This goes as much for Judaism as it does for Christianity. Neither has much intrinsic usefulness where this scientific scheme is concerned. If some students feel hurt by this statement, that cannot be helped. The day of most contemporary faiths is over. They have been more of a curse than a boon to mankind. Nothing that I say here, however, should reflect on the peoples concerned, those who accept these religions. They are merely unfortunate. The religion itself is worn out and indeed is dying. <clears throat> the end note here. Given the fact that many baby boomers today seem to be returning to the religions they grew up with, it seems that Regardier's predictions was premature. It would be more accurate to say that for many people these religions are not dying but evolving hopefully for the better. The Kabbalah has nothing to do with any of them. Attempts on the part of cultish partisans to impart higher mystical meanings through the Kabbalah, etc. to their now sterile faiths is futile and will be seen as such by the younger generations. They, the flower and love children, will have none of this nonsense. And another end note. <clears throat> this statement reflects the time in which this introduction was written, 1970. We fear that Regardi might have misguided the misjudged the flower and the love children, many of whom are now walking in the footsteps of their parents. I felt this a long time ago, as I still do, but even more so. The only way to explain the partisan Jewish attitude demonstrated in some small sections of the book can readily be explained. I had been reading some writings of Arthur Edward White, Christian mystic and occultist A.E. Waite, 
1875 through 1940, was a prolific author of several books. The Holy Kabbalah, 1924, is considered by many to be his greatest work. He was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And some of his pomposity and turgidity stuck to my mantle. I disliked his patronizing Christian attitude and so swung all the way over to the other side of the pendulum. Actually, neither faith is particularly important in this day and age. I must be careful never to read weight again before embarking upon literary work of my own. Much knowledge obtained by the ancients through the use of the Kabbalah has been supported by discoveries of modern scientists, anthropologists, astronomers, psychiatrists et al. Learned Kabbalists for hundreds of years have been aware of what the psychiatrist has only discovered in the last few decades, that man's concept of himself, his deities and the universe is a constantly evolving process, changing as man himself evolves on a higher spiral. But the roots of his concepts are buried in a race consciousness that, ne that antedated Neanderthal men by uncounted aeons of time. What Jung calls archetypal images constantly rise to the surface of man's awareness. From the vast unconscious that is the common heritage of all mankind. The tragedy of civilized man is that he is cut off from awareness of his own instincts. The Kabbalah can help him achieve the necessary understanding to effect a reunion with them, so that rather than being driven by forces he does not understand, he can harness for his conscious use the same power that guides the homing pigeon, teaches the beaver how to build a dam, and keeps the planets revolving in their appointed orbits about the Sun. I began the study of the Kabbalah at an early age. Two books I have read then have played unconsciously a prominent part in the writing of my own book. One of these was QBL or The Bride's Reception by Frater Ahad. a British occultist and one of Crowley's principal disciples. Brother Unity wrote the QBL or the Bride's Reception in 1923. Pater Achad or Charles Stansfeld Jones, which I must have first read around 1926. The other was an introduction to the Tarot by Paul Foster Case. Published in the early 1920s, it is now out of print, superseded by later versions of the same topic. But as I now glance through this slender book, I perceive how profoundly even the format of his book had influenced me. Though in these two instances, there was not a trace of plagiarism. It had not consciously occurred to me until recently that I owed so much to them. Since Paul Case passed away about a decade or so ago, this gives me the opportunity to thank him, overtly, wherever he may be. By the middle of 1926, I had become aware of the work of Alistair Crowley, for whom I have a tremendous respect. I studied as many of his writings as I could gain access to, making copious notes and later acted for several years as his secretary, having joined him in Paris on October 12, 1928, a memorable day in my life.
For more information about this period in Regardier's life, see our introduction to the third edition of Regardier's The Middle Pillar. All sorts of books have been written on the Kabbalah. Some poor, some few others extremely good. But I came to feel the need for what might be called a sort of Berlitz handbook, a concise but comprehensive introduction, studded with diagrams and tables of easily understood definitions and correspondences, so to simplify the student's grasp of so complicated and abstruse a subject. During a short retirement in North Devon in 1931, I began to amalgamate my notes. It was out of these that a garden of pomegranates gradually emerged. I unashamedly admit that my book contains many direct quotes from Crowley, Waite, Eliphas Levi, and D. H. Lawrence. I had incorporated numerous fragments from their works into my notebooks without citing individual references to the various sources from which I condensed my notes. Prior to the closing down of the Mandrake Press in London about 1930-31, I was employed as company secretary for a while. Along with several Crowley books, the Mandrake Press published a lovely little monogram by D. H. Lawrence entitled Apropos of Lady Chatterley's Lover. My own copy accompanied me on my travels for long years. Only recently did I discover that it had been lost. I hope that any one of my former patients who had borrowed it will see fit to return it to me forthwith. The last chapter of A Garden deals with the way of a return. It used almost entirely Crowley's concept of the path as described in his superb essay, One Star in Sight. From Crowley, Magic and in Theory and Practice, page 229 through 244. In addition to this, I borrowed extensively from Lawrence's apropos. Somehow, they all fitted together very nicely. In time, all these variegated notes were incorporated into the text without acknowledgement, an oversight which I now feel sure would be forgiven since I was only 24 at the time. Some modern nature worshippers and members of the newly washed and redeemed witch cult have complimented me on this closing chapter which I entitled The Ladder. I am pleased about this. For a very long time I was not at all familiar with the topic of witchcraft. I had avoided it entirely, not being attracted to its literature in any way. In fact, I only became slightly conversant with its theme and literature just a few years ago, after reading The Anatomy of Eve, written by Dr. Leopold Stein, a Jungian analyst. In the middle of his study of four cases, he included a most inform informative chapter on the subject. This served to stimulate me to wider reading in that area. In 1932, at the suggestion of Thomas Burke, the novelist, I submitted my manuscript to one of the publishers, Monsieur Constable, in London. They were unable to use it but made some encouraging comments and advised me to submit it to writers. To my delight and surprise, writers published it and throughout the years, the reaction it has had indicated other students found it also fulfilled their need for a condensed and simplified survey of such a vast subject as the Kabbalah. The importance of the book to me was and is fivefold. 
One, it provided a yardstick by which to measure my personal progress in the understanding of the Kabbalah. Two, therefore, it can have an equivalent value to the modern student. And three, it serves as a theoretical introduction to the Kabbalistic foundation of the magical work of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And four, it throws considerable light on the occasionally obscure writings of Aleister Crowley. And five, it is dedicated to Crowley, who was the Ankh af na Konzu, mentioned in the Book of the Law, a dedication which served both as a token of personal loyalty to Crowley, but was also a gesture of my spiritual independence from him. In his profound investigation into the origins and basic nature of man, Robert Ardrey in African Genesis recently made a shocking statement. The reference in the end notes for this book is African Genesis, a personal investigation into animal origins and nature of man. Although man has begun the conquest of outer space, the ignorance of his own nature, says Audrey, has become institutionalized, universalized, and sanctified. Unquote. He further states that were a brotherhood of man to be formed today, quote, its only possible common bond would be ignorance of what man is. Unquote. Such a condition is both deplorable and appalling when the means are readily available for man to acquire a thorough understanding of himself. And in doing so, an understanding of his neighbor and the world in which he lives, as well as the greater universe of which each is a part. May everyone who reads this new edition of A Garden of Pomegranates be encouraged and inspired to light his own candle of inner vision and begin his journey to the boundless space that lies within himself. Then, through realization of his true identity, each student can become a lamp unto his own path. And more awareness of the truth of his being will rip asunder the veil of unknowing that has heretofore enshrouded the star he already is, permitting the brilliance of his light to illumine the darkness of that part of the universe in which he abides. Israel Regardi That illustration in the front of the introduction to the second edition. And now for the preface. Based on the versicle in the Song of Songs, thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates. A book entitled Pardis Rimonim came to be written by Rabbi Moses Cordovero in the 16th century. By some authorities this philosopher is considered as the greatest lamp in post-Zoharic days of that spiritual menorah, the Kabbalah, which with so rare a grace and so profuse an irradiation of the supernal light 
illuminated the literature and religious philosophy of the Jewish people as well as their immediate and subsequent neighbors in the diaspora. The English equivalent of Pardis Rimonim, a garden of pomegranates, I have adopted as the title of my own modest work, although I am forced to confess that this latter has but little connection either in fact, actual fact or in historicity with that of Cordovero. <clears throat> in the golden harvest of purely spiritual intimations <clears throat> which the Holy Kabbalah brings, I truly feel that a veritable garden of the soul may be builded, a garden of immense magnitude and lofty significance, wherein may be discovered by each one of us all manner and kind of exotic fruit and gracious flower of exquisite color. The pomegranate, may I add, has always been the mystic's every been for mystics everywhere a favorable object for recondite symbolism. The end note for that being the Greeks believed that the pomegranate sprang from the blood of Dionysus. It is also a symbol of fertility and abundance. According to Serlot, the primary significance of the pomegranate arises from its shape and internal structure. It represents the quote, reconciliation of the multiple and diverse within apparent unity. End quote. In the Bible, it is a symbol of the oneness of the universe. Serlot, page 261. The garden or orchard has likewise produced in that book named the Book of Splendor. Sefer Zohar also known as the Book of Splendor, is considered one of the major Kabbalistic texts. It consists of various texts that collectively form a commentary on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. It also includes short Midrashic statements and discussions of many topics. The Zohar was primarily written between 1280 and 1286 by Moses Ben Shem Tov de Leon. An almost inexhaustible treasure of spiritual imagery of superb and magnificent taste. This book goes forth then in the hope that, as a modern writer has put it, there are not many those who have no secret garden of the mind, for this garden alone can give refreshment when life is barren of peace or sustenance or satisfactory answer. Such sanctuaries may be reached by a certain philosophy or faith, by the guidance of a beloved author or an understanding friend, by way of the temples of music and art, or by groping after truth through the vast kingdom of knowledge. They encompass almost always truth and beauty, and are radiant with the light that never was on sea or land. Clare Cameron, Green Fields of England. 
Should there be those who are so unfortunate as to possess no such sacred sanctuary of their own, one builded with their own hands, I humbly offer this well-tended garden of pomegranates, which has been bequeathed to me. I hope that therein may be gathered a few little shoots, a rare flower or two, or some ripe fruit, which may serve as the nucleus or the wherewithal for the planting of such a secret garden in the mind, without which there is no peace, nor joy, nor happiness. It is fitting that a note or appreciation to my predecessors in Kabbalistic research should accompany this work, in which I have endeavored to present an exposition of the basic principles underlying the Kabbalah, to serve as a textbook for its study. I have scrupulously avoided contention and unnecessary controversy. I am greatly indebted to Madame H. P. Blavatsky writings, and I believe I shall not be too egoistical or egotistical in claiming that a proper understanding of the principles outlined herein will reveal many points of subtlety and philosophic interest in her secret doctrine, and aid in the comprehension of this monumental work of hers. An end note here about Helena Petrova Blavatsky, 1831 to 1891, or HPB, as she was often called, was one of the founding members of the Theosophical Society, 19 or 1875, the Theosophical movement, which was primarily Eastern in its mystical focus, taught the ideas of spiritual teaching ideas of a spiritual teaching that was common to all humanity. The universal brotherhood of mankind, the study of comparative religion, and the exploration of man's latent spiritual faculties. The same is also true of S. L. MacGregor Mather's translation of portions of the Zohar, the Kabbalah Unveiled, and of Arthur E. Waite's excellent compendium of the Zohar, The Secret Doctrine in Israel. Both of which are closed books in the main to most students of mystical love and philosophy who do not have the specialized comparative knowledge which I have endeavored to incorporate in this little book. I should here call attention to a tract, the author of which is unknown, entitled The Thirty-Two Paths of Wisdom, of which splendid translations have been made by W. Wynne Westcott, Arthur E. Waite, and Knut Stendring. In the course of time this appears to have become incorporated into and affiliated with the text of the Sefer Yetzirah, although several critics place it at a later date than the genuine Mishnahs. Mishnah means repetitions. It refers to a codifications of oral teachings. However, in giving the titles of the paths from this tract, I have named throughout the source as the Sefer Yetzira to avoid unnecessary confusion. It is to be hoped that no adverse criticism will arise on this point. Since the question of magic has been slightly dealt with in the last chapter of this book, it is perhaps advisable here to state that the interpretations given to certain doctrines 
and to some of the Hebrew letters border very closely on magical formula. I have purposely refrained, however, from entering into a deeper consideration of the practical Kabbalah, although several hints of value may be discovered in the explanation of the Tetragrammaton, for example, which may prove of no inconsiderable service. As I have previously remarked, this book is primarily intended as an elementary textbook of the Kabbalah, interpreted as a new system for philosophical classification. This must constitute my sole excuse for what may appear to be a refusal to deal more adequately with methods of attainment. Israel Regardi. Part 1. A Garden of Pomegranates. Israel Regardi. An Outline of the Kabbalah. 